r a y m o n d Ravaglia รองคณะบดีและผู้อำนวยการ Stanford Pre College of Studies ผู้ร่วมก่อตั้งโครงการการศึกษาสำหรับเด็กที่มีพรสวรรค์ Stanford University สหรัฐอเมริกาจุดสนใจคือเด็กๆที่หวังจะเข้าเรียนในมหาวิทยาลัยที่มีชื่อเสียงอย่าง Stanford พวกที่มีความพร้อมทางวิชาการและอีกหลายๆกรณีทำให้มีความต้องการได้รับการศึกษาและประสบการณ์ทางปัญญามากกว่าสิ่งที่นำเสนอในโรงเรียนปกติเราเคยทำงานกับคอมพิวเตอร์ในสมัยก่อนๆและเราก็ทำงานกับคอมพิวเตอร์ในสมัยก่อนๆและเราก็ทำงานกับคอมพิวเตอร์ในสมัยก่
and Stanford actually had a project in Thailand in the 70s to do a radio-based mathematics program. So I just wanted to make acknowledgement there. As we've been working on online programs, it's been a target that has kept moving. When we started initially, we thought that we could use the computer as a way to supplement traditional courses and provide students with individualized drill and practice so that they could do homework and get immediate feedback to their homework. As we started experimenting with that, we realized that by using machine intelligence to assess the work students were doing, we could gain some insight into their learning and had great hopes of individualizing the instruction and really shifting from the teacher driving the class to the computer driving the class and to each student working by themselves at their own pace with the highly individualized and personalized instruction. And that seemed to be the great promise of the technology. And what we found when we put that out there was that students were broadly dissatisfied and unhappy. And the completion rate for our courses was maybe 30%, 35%. But when you're a university just offering enrichment courses, you're not looking at the students who are failing. You're looking at the students who are successfully getting through these courses and considering yourself to have quite an achievement. When you're a parent of a student, you're not so happy if your child is in the group that has not been successful. I was at a conference in October and someone from edX was talking about a course that they had offered, one of these large free courses, that they had had 150,000 students start the course and there were 7,000 students who succeeded at the end. And again, this might be something that's useful for continuing professional education, but when you're talking about educating children, you cannot afford to have the vast majority of students who are taking your courses fail. As we started looking at what was working and what was making students excited about learning, we realized that the technology per se was not it, but rather it was the ability of the technology to bring the students together. And when we created the online high school, we decided to move away from what most people are doing with online learning these days, which is that intense, individualized, personalized, self-paced approach to, in essence, what I like to say, use 21st technology to deliver a 12th century education. And at this point, I'm going to run an eight-minute film that will show you the online high school as seen by the students and parents in the school, and then I'll come back make a few more comments about it, and then get into the lessons that we've actually learned. So on that note, if you can play film. I really always liked science, even as a young kid. I was always actually in advanced mathematics ever since second grade. Uh, I've been acting for the past 10 years. Um, I am currently living and traveling aboard a boat. When you're a musician and you love what you do, music is really all you want to do. Every child has something within them that sparkles. And the, the challenge uh, of a teacher is to find out what is that extraordinary thing and to cultivate it, to draw it out. are excited about learning. They do their reading for English class or they work their problems for chemistry, not because it's required, but because it's actually interesting. We want to discuss it with all of our friends. Um, ben alluded to this last class, this, this social dimension to identity, right? When people hear about an online high school, they immediately think socialization problems. But the model of online they have is the model of most online education, which is totally asynchronous. The students are just watching lectures and emailing a teacher. So the first thing is that we meet in classes, right? We, we talk to each other. We, we all come to class. We just happen to come to a virtual class. Is Kafka presenting a dualist view of the mind or, or a materialist one? It's, it, you have a parallel discussion that's happening uh, between responses in audio and video and textual interaction between all of the students in the class all at once. So it's, it's really not a situation where you're in a, a lecture hall and you're listening to the teacher. I think the most productive way to work through literary work is to, to discuss it in small groups. 
They listen to the lectures ahead of time. They do their reading ahead of time. They do their homework ahead of time. And so now they come to their discussion section to discuss. And the professors are there to get them engaged in the, in the work. And they're learning from one another and the different points of view. Bringing together the students with their talents and also their different perspectives into an uh, intellectual community is something that the school does uniquely well. Even though he knew most of the answers, he encouraged others to volunteer solutions and participate in class. Congratulations. <laughs> students come from all over. There are students in 42 states and almost 30 countries. I have friends in China, California, India. There's really nothing like being able to hear a student from Sweden talk about the Swedish democratic system versus a student from the United States and then a student who may be looking at it from a different angle uh, in China or other parts of Asia. You bring all those perspectives together, you get this amazing melting pot of ideas in the classroom. Tell them what it is. We have this thing called the core program, where it's four, four years worth of courses, one course a year, that's mandatory for all OHS students. The first year is a field biology course, the second is a history of science, third a political science, and the fourth a moral philosophy course. Basically, high schoolers learn about philosophy and about the examined life and about sort of thinking critically and rigorously. When I was in the History of Science course, we all wrote 25 page papers. Not because we wanted to impress the teacher or we wanted to send it to colleges, but because we were so in love with the topics. That's not to say that there aren't challenges. It's stressful, it's difficult, and there will be roadblocks, but those hurdles are worth it because you get to be a part of this community. You meet people who are doing things that are so unbelievably cool. You had no idea a high schooler was doing this. OHS was a bit of a shock when I first came in, but the hard classes were really, really fun because they were challenging me and I hadn't been challenged in a while. There is a spirit of, this is going to be really hard, you should try and make it harder. See if you can beat that even greater challenge. And they're feisty. They will argue, they will debate, they will call you out if they think something doesn't make sense. And so I'm always learning from my students here and I really, really enjoy that. These teachers actually have PhDs or master's degrees in what they do, and that just reflects a love of the subject that they teach. So they're obviously very open about sharing their knowledge. You know, they can answer all the straightforward questions in their conventional classroom, and what our teachers can add to their experience is asking the follow-up question uh, to think about the larger context in which they're maintaining that position. It's remarkable that a young person at 15 years old is being asked, what is your discourse based on what you're learning and understanding? It's not really about the grade you get at the end with at the OHS. It's really about the teachers and the process that you go through. So it's quite a different experience, and you can connect with people who love what you love. Probably around third grade or so, she began to become more introverted as uh, she realized a lot of her fellow students didn't share the same interests that she did academically. As she started meeting more and more kids at the online high school, that started to change. She started to come back to her old self. So that was, we thought that was an extreme benefit to this program. The students have all their kinds of venues for socialization as well. They have regional meetups where they get together. They watch movies together. You can form a club if you get a faculty sponsor, and it can be about basically anything you want. To <laughs> I started the astronomy club at the school. We'd meet once every two weeks and talk about everything from the discovery of the Higgs boson particle to Star Trek versus Star Wars. I ran a weekend of regional meetups to help students who didn't know each other meet each other. And I think that for being online, we really have a very involved, active, and interested community of people. It wasn't easy for our teachers when we could solve complex problems in our heads, but struggled to grasp the basic logistics of submitting assignments on time. And yet you accepted our eccentricities and often appreciated them like nobody else had. OHS 
helps us become who we are truly meant and aim to be if we put into the equation the same degree of dedication and good faith that the faculty and staff do put in us each day that they continue to provide us a premier education. Can I work in this environment? Can I, can I manage my own deadlines? Can I work on these really difficult assignments? This is a challenge that I feel like everyone should be offered. OHS is about giving students the opportunity to pursue outside interests, academic or otherwise, for instance, in my case, travel. Everyone at the OHS has this deep and abiding passion for knowledge. When you come to the OHS, you realize that it's not about what you learn, it's about improving your skills so that you can be set up for a life of learning. So this is an online school. The only time these students see each other is if they meet up regionally, they come to Stanford, some of them for the graduation event, which runs three days in June. We also do a two-week residential program in August. What's remarkable about the video and about the way the students and the instructors talk about the experience is it is purely about the relationships that they have with each other. It is not about the technology. And this was one of the important things we realized 16, 17 years into developing computer-based courses for students, it was that at the end of the day, especially when you're working with K-12 students, the product isn't the software. The product is educated students. And the focus needs to be on making the school work for the students. I often tell people at the school, you can imagine the technology not working and the school being great. You can imagine a student saying, of the online high school, I mean, the other students, they're so exciting, the teachers, they're so smart, the technology, nah, it doesn't always work, but the school is wonderful. You can't imagine someone saying, the other students, they're sort of stupid, the teachers, not as good as at my old school, but the immersive video conferencing technology is so compelling, you just have to go to this school. It is very much about the relationships, and this is really a key thing that I want to stress. So just some quick facts about the school. The, we call it a high school, it is actually a six-year school, so ranging in grades from seven to 12. We have students entering the school younger than the traditional age. While we kick everybody out at 18, we have a variety of university level courses as well. So the hope is that we can keep students engaged until they're at the traditional age to enter college. The school is fully accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. So like any other high school in the United States, it has its own diploma. We have students who come to the school full time half-time or single course, about 40% of the students are full-time. Another 30% or so are taking a half-time course of study. The remainder are just taking single courses with us. One of the things we believe strongly is that we should not own the students, but rather we should be part of the solution they need to find an optimal education. Part of keeping students like this fully engaged and fully productive is keeping them challenged and giving them an opportunity to pursue their interests with students who share these interests and with instructors who know how to guide these interests. As was stated in the course, we've taken a college-style approach to the school day. So for any given course, we expect the students, so a typical course in a typical week, 
you will have three or four lectures which are 15 to 20 minutes long. Those are recorded ahead of time. You should watch them as well as do your reading. And then you will have seminars. The seminars meet in real time. They are 60 to 90 minutes long. And because we have students across the globe, I often say the first period will begin at 6 a.m. California time. The 11th period will end around midnight California time. So we have classes that are running pretty much around the clock. The seminars are live, dynamic, and interactive. 16 students typically and an instructor. And the instructors are told this is not their time to talk. This is their time to elicit the students. So very much following the model of the best traditions in independent school education, we really want the students to engage with each other. We tell the, because everything is recorded, if an instructor finds that they are spending 15, 20 minutes setting up a point in a discussion, they can just keep that recording, make it a lecture, and work ever more towards keeping the seminars live and dynamic. The students that we have in the school come from a variety of populations who are looking for something more than they have locally available or for something more convenient or more challenging than locally available. So some of the students are gifted younger students who are just looking for more challenge. Some are students who are living international. We have a student who is half the year in Mumbai and half the year in New York City. So this is, allows him to go to one school and to stay with his family. We have other students who live in rural parts of the United States who, again, the alternative to this would be to go to a boarding school. And again, these parents like their children. These children like their parents. They want to stay in their local context but still have their needs fully met. We have other students who are engaged in outside activities, like Nick, who was in the movie, who was an actor, has been on a number of TV shows in the United States. We have students who are athletes or who are otherwise engaged, but who are still serious about their education, so they see the school as a way to have those needs met. Uh, in the United States, there's a strong tradition of homeschooling, so maybe four to five percent of the population are being educated at home, oftentimes the parents will realize that this child knows more than I do, and so they're looking for an alternative. This is something halfway between going to brick and mortar school and being at home. So the students can stay at home, but again, they can find the peer group and the instructors that they need to fully realize their abilities. This year, 541 students, 21 countries, I believe, represented, Country, students who are all over the world. 11% of the students are international right now. As you saw in the movie, the discussion seminar and that environment of real-time, synchronous, virtual classroom is key. We take a blended approach in that we are blending asynchronous and synchronous. We take a flipped classroom approach in that we want the students to have done the reading and to have watched the lectures before they come to the seminar. But otherwise, this is very much the type of education you would find at any of the top boarding schools. We have also been experimenting with, in addition to students coming in as individual points of presence, working with other schools who might have small groups of students at their school, and so having room-to-room-to-room -to -room -to -room interaction. And this opens up more active possibilities for collaborating with schools and not just from, with students working at home. The academic program is what you would expect to find at an academically competitive high school. We have built an emphasis on creative education, on active production of essays, detailed arguments, creative solutions to problems, problem-based learning, all of the modern trends, but in a very traditional curriculum. The one thing where we differ significantly from a standard US curriculum is with the core. And in the film, the students had mentioned the core sequences. And these are philosophy courses that in the first year it's a biology and methodology of science. The second year it's a history of science and culture. 
the third year, a course called Democracy, Freedom, and the Rule of Law, which introduces students to the British liberal tradition, and the final course, Critical Reading and Argumentation. And these courses are designed to give students an ability to think critically and reflectively about their education and about how they're learning, they also achieve a couple of interesting results. The History of Science and Culture course is a science course, but one that is not taking a mathematical approach. It is taking a more historical approach. It is often the first science course that students who perhaps are verbally talented but not strong in mathematics really feel like they have an advantage. On the other hand, the Democracy, Freedom, and Rule of Law course, because it is a, working with British analytic philosophy, students who are very good at mathematics but who are perhaps not as verbally gifted find that this is the first humanities course where they can really achieve high results. And so these courses serve to change how students are thinking about themselves and how students are thinking about their material. Finally, the course on critical reading and argumentation really teaches the students to look critically at any material and to pick apart arguments. The joke that I make to parents and students is that in democracy, freedom, and rule and law, students will complain about how many pages they have to read. The critical reading and argumentation, they'll read maybe 10% as much, but it will take them just as long to read at fine level detail. In addition to the academic work, there is a full set of clubs. We set, there are no courses on Friday. Instead, the students in, interact with each other and the instructors in the extracurricular activities. In addition to ones that they would do online, sometimes they will come together. We have students participate in Model UN. We have students participate in Junior Classical League, a variety of things like that. The students do things like have Halloween costume contest online. They'll do a variety of things online. I often say to the parents that they should think of this more as an online boarding school than an online day school because the students are living in the context that they're going to school and they have opportunities to interact all the time. One of the things that we have found that is important to understand is that in a traditional school, if you look at how students interact, you will notice differences between how students interact in class when the instructor is there, how students interact in the classroom before or after the class begins, how students interact in the lunchroom, how students interact outside the school grounds while they are waiting for their parents to pick them up, or if they're waiting for the bus to come by the way students interact in the cafe across the street, and the way the students interact in the cafe downtown. In each of these spaces, students will have varying degrees of comfort and formality or informality in what they're willing to say and how they interact with each other. Unless you can provide these types of different spaces in an online school, the students will feel that there is something missing you need to have all of these there if they're going to have a complete and full experience in an online environment that will be comparable to what they would have gotten in a traditional school. And if you do not have those components, inevitably students will leave the school because they will feel the absence. The, the students have done quite well at university admissions. We have had just about 100 students graduate to date a uh, little over 10% have come to Stanford. Most students have gone to competitive schools. Um, we've had students go to all of the Ivy League schools and pretty much anywhere you would want to see students go. When I ask the students how they find it, the most frequent response is that they're mildly disappointed. They find that what they had been doing in high school was more academically rigorous and competitive in some sense, and they have a longing for that. The other thing that they find is that because they are so used to working intimately with instructors who have PhDs, because they develop such familiarity with the instructors at Stanford, when they go to university, that familiarity will carry forward. And so they are, find it easy to go to instructor office hours, to talk to their professors, to speak their voices. They really develop an authentic voice at the school, and they're able to carry that forward into their higher education and throughout their lives. 
So, you know, what have we learned in 25 years of building online courses and culminating in the online high school? The most important lesson, the one I've mentioned and that I will continue to stress, is that the human element is always going to trump the technology. And the efforts that we spent the first 16, 17 years working on to develop, to use machine intelligence to assess student understanding and deliver highly individualized curriculum, we really found that no matter how good you did with that, it was maybe 15 to 20 percent of what you need to have for a student to be fully engaged in learning in a class. If you think about the difference between teaching a course with a excellent and beautiful textbook or teaching a course with a lousy textbook, at the end of the day, the quality of the teacher and the quality of the other students will matter much more than whether the textbook was good or not. And in fact, a good teacher with a bad textbook will produce much better results than a bad teacher with a good textbook. The other thing, too, that we found is that purely asynchronous approaches to online learning are, I describe them as relentless and unforgiving. If you're in a course that is purely asynchronous, the only time the student they are in the course is when they are actually sitting there working. The only way to get from beginning to end in the course is to sit down and work through all the material. And from a designing point of view, you think this is wonderful because you will know exactly what students have done and what they have mastered if they are going to finish the course. From a sort of perspective of students throughout the ages, this is not how it works. Being in a class is all about showing up to the classroom at the right time. Sometimes you have done the reading beforehand. Sometimes you show up not having done the reading and you pretend. Often you might go back later and read what was important, or you might decide that this material was not important at all and never do it. At first, it seems like this is a weakness, but it is an essential component of traditional education. And when you pull this away, the students find difficulty getting through courses. And that's one of the things that is most significant in driving attrition in asynchronous courses high. From an ins another point of view of the students, especially gifted students, if you're in a self-paced course, the only time you're interacting with the instructor is when you get stuck and have questions. A lot of students enjoy the experience of demonstrating their mastery in front of other students. They want to be smart and they want to be seen as being smart. From the teacher's perspective, Part of the great joy of teaching is seeing the light bulb go off in the student's head while you're in class, seeing the success. What we found in our pure asynchronous courses was that the only time the students would ever come to talk to the instructor is when they were stuck or having problems. So all of the positive reinforcement of teaching was removed and the teachers just saw students while they had difficulties and once the problem was solved, they would never see the student again. So they would often wonder if the student didn't come back because they were successful or they didn't come back because they left. Also, looking at sort of the behavior of students and instructors, we found in a pure asynchronous environment, there's a tendency among the instructors to try to make things as efficient as possible. They will develop large collections of standard responses to student email and questions. They will shift how they teach so that they are very much serving the program who becomes the primary instructor. And at first the instructors will marvel at how efficient this is and then inevitably they will quit because it is not interesting to be a servant to the program. On the other hand, we found that instructors who teach in the virtual classroom environment they will spend a lot of time complaining about how much work they do and complaining about how the technology is inadequate to really achieve what they want to achieve. But they never leave, and they are tremendously satisfied at the end of the day. They like to complain, but this is a trait of instructors, especially of good instructors who like to be self-critical. But we find that it is deeply satisfying to teach in this environment. And again, it is because of the interaction between the students and the instructors. I tell the parents that 
The reason the school works is because we are bringing the right students and instructors together and we are getting out of the way. The important thing to remember is that if you are building an online school, it is the schoolness that is essential. The onlineness is the enabling technology and it cannot be the thing that is focused on. The second point that I will stress is that one must be wary of what I call the content-centric view of courses. If you listen to current discussions of online learning and current discussions of individualized learning courses for these types of students, the focus is always on the content. Thinking of education as a process that takes content knowledge and moves it into the heads of students. If you think about why this is so, a lot of this is driven by the textbook publishers who have a natural inclination to view everything as content. A lot of it is driven by the fact that the learning management system companies and other things, it is just much easier to think in terms of knowledge objects and content and knowledge maps and representing the content knowledge state of students. But if you think about what really constitutes education, my favorite tagline about education is that an education is what remains when we've forgotten everything we've learned. An education really lies more in the habits of mind and the ways of thinking that are the characteristics of a well-educated individual. When we are talking about students who are pre-college, it's particularly important to look at these courses as laying down the habits of learning that are going to last for a lifetime not just getting them to understand a particular thing. And the way you learn content, the way you learn these habits of mind and ways of thinking is to see them modeled in the classroom environment around each other. I would say too that people should be aware of textbooks posing as courses. If we look at MOOCs, again, there is this body of content that is being wrapped up and presented as though it is a course. But in reality, it is really, at best, sort of an interactive textbook. These can be useful tools, but they are useful tools when they are combined with the real-time seminar environment. I often joke that the best thing that the MOOCs have going for them is having grabbed the name course to describe themselves. If they had called themselves massive open online textbooks, then the acronym would have been MOOT, which would have suggested something very different about their utility. Another thing that is important and that we have learned is that it is essential in good education to pay attention to the process and not just the outcomes. We want to know not just that the students have learned something, but we want to know how they are thinking about it. We want to look at what's going on there. This point is well illustrated by anyone who's taught a mathematics course has had the experience of a student comes into your office, they're confused about something, they can't even articulate their confusion. And so you say, here, just grab the chalk and go to the board. Let's, let's try to solve this problem. And just watching how they approach the problem, how they stop and start, you can often immediately see what the confusion is and you can go in and address that. Trying to tease this out of a student by going back and forth with email can take forever, if not be impossible. And that is because of the difference between getting the full dynamic process that is going on and just the static snippets in between. When I think of the proper role for information technology in these sorts of courses, there are certainly good things that can be done for personalizing instruction, for creating nice dynamic textbooks, beautiful things. Richard will certainly be talking about some of the things that can be done there. And I say these are great things, but they are not sufficient. We must take these and integrate them into the rich learning environment that brings students and instructors together to really let the learning happen. I think there are good potentials too for the big data, and so everything should be recorded, all of the interactions, all of the lessons, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that the product, especially when we are talking K-12 education, cannot be the software objects, but it has to be educated children. We have to make sure that we are able to educate all of the children we are admitting into the environment. 
as for these students, when we look at the online high school, we are looking at students whose ability places them in probably the top three to five percent of the population. They like to think that their ability places them in the top one hundredth of a percent of the population. But as someone who has read their applications and looked at their test scores before they come to us, I know the ability is wider. But for these students, what's important is to not just to teach them to think deeply, analytically, create. They need to be able to be creative and productive in their thinking. They need to be able to express themselves well, to find their voice and articulate it. They need to be able to look at things critically and pick things apart. What is absolutely certain is that in the future, a hundred years ago, anything that was published, you could make reasonable assumptions that someone had edited it. In the future, most things that people will encounter will have had no editorial input at all. And there will be increasing amounts of nonsense out there. Students need to be able to look at things and quickly decide, is this a valid document? Does this have actual information in it? They need to be able to curate things themselves. They need to be able to look critically at things, look behind the frame, understand what's there. We need to teach students how to do this we need to teach students that beyond the content is context, habits of mind, ways of thinking, how to bring these things together. As to how to apply these lessons in the developing world, I think the important thing to understand is that if you are building an educational ecosystem, you need to build the entire ecosystem. You cannot just focus on part and then hope that things will roll up. When we launched the school, we did not just do ninth grade and admit students in one year. When we came out, we had the whole school there from the beginning, even if there were parts of it that were not occupied. What will bring students in is knowing that they are not going to run out of things to do. With the online high school, we've been about trying to demonstrate how this technology can be used to bring together students who need this type of solution to deliver an optimal education. I think that if you take a place like Bangkok, from what I've heard, as students move away from the city center, you have students who will spend, in high school, two hours commuting to school and back from school. Students spending a lot of time doing things that are less productive than studying and interacting with each other. I think there are great opportunities to use this style of education, this model, and to create opportunities for students to really realize their potential. It is great to be able to bring the students physically together, but it is even better to keep them challenged and finding a way to use the technology and the proximity to do both really is key. One of the things that I would love to reduce is no one should ever have to be shipped off to the United States or the UK or Australia to go to boarding school. The, what one can get from there, one can get more from this type of online program combined with very specific opportunities to have intense experience of short duration. If this can be done well, the students can fully realize their ability, they can experience the world while still benefiting their communities. In the same way, the technology is a very good way to pull top instructors into this type of environment. Many of the people I find to teach for me would never want to go and work at a traditional high school, but the freedom and opportunity that this type of online program gives them to really pursue topics that they are passionate about with students who share this passion is deeply rewarding. So there is no reason not to build something like this. So I know that the time is up right now. I'm just being shown one minute. So let us uh, take it open for questions. And I think we have about 15 minutes available for questions, but I will let the folk drive that. But the important thing is my email addresses are there. And so if you wake up with a question tomorrow, next week, next year, find something you want to talk about, 
please send me an email. I'm always happy to get email from people. And if your email is interesting, then I promise I'll respond. So are there questions? Anybody like me to talk about anything, anything you were hoping I would have talked about that I didn't say? So for the Q&A session, yang mi kai tam kam tam pum tam kap kun Raymond Ravaklia me ka. I actually have some questions oh, okay. uh, myself. Sure actually, enough. I want to bring your lecture a little bit closer to Thailand, since you talk about like homeschooling and e-learning, which is not often practiced in Thailand. How do we encourage people here in Thailand to realize that these are the one of the practical options that they can take? I think the to encourage people to take courses online. That, that is something that getting people engaged in e-learning happens by seeing examples of programs like ours. So if they see top students who are doing these programs and then getting admission to top universities, it becomes something that is very appealing. When e-learning started, it was often seen as something that people were skeptical about. But the skepticism goes away when they start seeing the results. One of the reasons why we make it possible for students to come to the online high school and just take one course rather than be full time is because we understand that it is a big decision to move to this type of environment, and so it provides the opportunity for people to dip their toes in the water. And I think finding short courses that students can do during their hol school holidays, during the summers, during times where they would be otherwise disengaged is a good way for people to gain a taste for this and then there just needs to be an openness for experimentation and that openness for experimentation part of it is getting the families to be comfortable with it but that also depends on the regulatory climate on making sure that work that students do in an online environment can be transferred back to their home schools one of the reasons why at Stanford we got created the online high school and became fully accredited with her own diploma was so that if a student did work with us and had difficulty bringing it back to their, home, to their original school, they could instead take the work that they had done at their original school, transfer it to us, and then we could give them the diploma. So we wanted to make it so that the students could mash up their education and really be in the driver's seat rather than having the institution dictate exactly what they needed to do. So that this can be well addressed with the uh, regulatory framework. Uh, being in the technology industri industry myself, I'm intrigued to know that what kind of technology or software they're being used in your school. Yeah, so from, for the, we've had a commitment from the beginning to always using commercially available products rather than trying to develop our own software. A big mistake that universities make is thinking that they can f attract and retain programming talent, when in reality the programming talent will always go to places like Apple and Google and Facebook, especially when you're Stanford and these are nearby the university. Um, so what we've been using for the virtual classroom environments, uh, historically we've used um, Saba Centra, but we've also used WebEx, and we are considering right now Adobe Premiere and Microsoft Link. But, um, Generally, these products are interchangeable on, on a fundamental level. For the learning management system, we have been using eCollege for a number of years. I have never liked eCollege. It is, I view it as sort of barely acceptable. And if we find something that's actually moderately acceptable, tolerable, better than eCollege, then we will make that move. And so we are in an active search role there. Um, you know, standard. Google Docs, Microsoft Office, standard products like that. All right. Okay, we have a few questions from the audience right here. We may have enough time for maybe two questions. Uh, one of the questions is, are there any challenging problems concerning overseas students learning online high school program? Or if there's any interesting cases to share how you solve these problems? Uh, the, the most challenging problem are students who think that they can do a full-time local high school program and the online high school full-time. Um, 
we had a student in Taiwan who was having terrible difficulty in the classes. And when we finally were able to sit down with him and his father, found that he was doing school in two places full time. And that's just not attainable. Part of the problem that we found is getting the time of day to work. One of the reasons why we have classes running until midnight California time is so that we can be until about 4 p.m. Asia. And we also find that students can get started early in the morning. Th those problems are tractable. The best thing is that we encourage all students, especially who are coming from far afield, is to come out the two-week in-person orientation that we do on the Stanford campus before the school year begins is tremendously useful because it lets students actually meet other people face-to-face, -face, which makes it much easier to become connected to them when they're in the online environment. And so I would say about a third of the students do, but of the students who do the orientation, their satisfaction happens much more quickly. I'm afraid that this will be the final question. Uh, the question is, is it expensive for this online education? Yeah, so for the online high school, the it is expensive, but let me put it in context. So the tuition for a full-time student in the online high school is 16,000 US. The median tuition for private high schools in the US is 22,000 and the sort of median tuition in the San Francisco Bay Area for private high schools is 36,000. So our goal is to keep our tuition at roughly 40% of the market price. And this can be done partly because of the efficiencies that online affords. And the biggest efficiency there is the ability to aggregate the tails of the distribution so that if we have a course in an esoteric subject and we have, say, four students who are full-time who need that course, we can find 12 other students who are just interested in that course so we can make sure the resources are always fully utilized. What drives the cost of education up typically is having poorly utilized resources. And so a lot of the potential for online is in those sorts of efficiencies. But Thank you so much. I'm afraid that all we had, that all the time we have. And if you have any other questions, you can send email yes. uh, as the given email address earlier. So thank you so much for giving us such an interesting lecture today. Thank you. Thank you. ค่ะขออนุญาตสรุปใจความจากการบรรยายหัวข้อมองอนาคตพลิกโฉมการศึกษาคนรุ่นใหม่กันสักนิดนึงนะคะท่านได้กล่าวถึงความหมายของการศึกษาค่ะแล้วก็ความสําคัญของการศึกษาในแบบสร้างสรรค์ในการพัฒนาประเทศนะคะนอกจากนี้ค่ะก็ยังได้พูดถึงบทบาทของเทคโนโลยีการสื่อสารเพื่อเพิ่มคุณภาพการศึกษาและก็การเข้าถึงแหล่งความรู้และข้อมูลโดยประสบการณ์ของ Stanford University ในการพัฒนาการเรียนรู้แบบออนไลน์โดยเฉพาะสําหรับเยาวชนที่มีความสามารถพิเศษค่ะเราหมดเวลาของการสัมมนา